Okay, Jay, I think we're good. Let's go. Superb. Hi, everyone. Welcome to um, track two. Today, we're going to be covering um, SEO trends you cannot afford to miss. We've got three fantastic 10 minute talks, which we'll kick off with in a second. And then we'll have Q and A um, session afterwards. So make sure that you get your questions ready for these experts. And um, I can make sure that I, I ask them and get you the answers that you need. So if um, we want to kick off with Laurent, who's technical director um, at Organic Agency, and he's going to be talking about the future of natural search. Thanks. I'll just quickly grab my screen. So, um, appreciate I've only got 10 minutes, so we're going to kind of just jump right into it. Um, I'm going to just sorry, my... sorry, Laurent. I'm just going to tell the guys that if they want, um, if they double click on your video, mm -hmm. then you'll take up the whole screen so they'll be able to concentrate on it. Good idea. Yeah, so I'm going to um, have a little bit of a talk around some of the things I see the future being um, and just generally give you some ideas, hopefully. I'm not going to go into too much detail. So who am I? Uh, I'm Technical Director Organic. I look after R&D um, and consult on all things tech with some of our big clients. We build data tools and we provide search consulting for some of the biggest retailers in the UK. Um, and recently I've become obsessed with some search data and hence the reason for this talk. Um, I'm originally from Barbados and weird flex, but I used to build fully realistic uh, flight simulators when I was at college. And there's a picture of one there. Um, a quick agenda for today, we're just gonna have a look at SERPs. Um, we're going to have a look at scale issues and we're going to look at some data magic and what we can use to, to uh, beat Google in a way. So as we all know, Google is absolutely king. They dominate the search space. In the UK, actually, they have about 92% market share with the next being Bing with only five. So when it comes to SEO, most of the time, we just don't even care about other search engines. We just pray to the mighty Google. Um, and for those not you familiar with SEO, what makes Google so popular is their search algorithm, and the algorithm determines what results to show, what order to show them in, and et cetera. How they ultimately rank you? Well, what Google cares about is user experience, and that boils down to these sort of three things, not just of their engine, but the experience that the users has, you know, the users get from sites that get served by their algorithm and pages that get served. And they favor well-structured, relevant content from sites that have authority on the subject rather than just pages with buzzwords. Um, and they do this by indexing and crawling your sites, reading content on the page, your structure, and more recently, understanding user experience through metrics like layout shift um, and other web vitals, which I would recommend having a look at, which are pretty cool. Um, and the algorithm looks at pages from, from a user's perspective. And, and as such, we treat user, uh, we treat Google as a bit of a user. And that means that optimization should be reasonably simple. And that's sort of true for small sites, but because we can apply this sort of EAT methodology that I've got laid out in front of you here, and we see fairly good results. But what happens when you are a retailer that has 3 million pages to manage? Um, what happens when you've got you know 25,000 product SKUs, 50,000 product SKUs? How do you know what you're going to optimize, when? how to do it, what to even talk about, um, because your authority just covers your so much. Well, I think we can tackle it in a few ways. Um, we can actually use Google's own user experience model against them here. Um, going back to thinking of Google as a user, you know, we already optimize our sites for user experience. We collect data, we see where they go, what they click on, um, how they travel through our funnel. So we should be applying this back to Google's bot as well. Um, and sites generate a huge amount of data as well as, you know, you've got external tools, you've got Google SERPs themselves. Um, so we're going to take a look at a few of these data points and, and hopefully pull some insight out of it. If we take Google's own see, think, do, care model, which probably a lot of marketers will be very familiar with, it seems to be the most popular thing at the moment, um, we can actually think of a few things. So just think of Google as another one of your users. Um, we can actually look at user experience before they even start searching for what they want. And this comes in the form of social news trends, um, even weather data. You know, we can, we can get a huge amount of insight of what people are going to be seeing before they even make a search. 
And we can apply data each stage of a user journey. So as I've plotted around the corner here, we'll, we'll have a look. Um, and we can collect this because it's public to you and it's public to your users. Um, and then we can take our analytical data that we have in our sites and we can validate our hypothesis that we, we build through this model. Um, and we can use our analytical data as well to transform content to better see our users. So if we think about C, um, you know, people are seeing social news trends that turns into visibility as well. You know, how much of the SERP space do you, do you cover? When we start to look at users thinking, we're actually having a look at things like search console data. We can see what users are typing in to reach our pages. Um, and we can get better understanding of how their thinking process works. Um, and also the Google search themselves, right? We can we can pull those and grab that and understand um, what Google's serving our users ultimately. And then we can tie that back. So normally in marketing, when we talk about care, we might talk about you know email retargeting and, and caring for our customers. But in this case, we can have a look at analytics and actually understand whether somebody reached the page they were trying to get to or not. Did they click through to somewhere else? Um, and we can start to look at making our pages more user friendly by making better content accessible quicker. Um, so you can actually take that model and, and apply it to, to search data to get much more insight from your users, but also to make Google believe that you're the best site you can be. What can we learn from some of this data? Well, we can figure out search habits. We can figure out where they're trying to reach. We can figure out what content Google prefers on your pages as well as what it prefers on competitors. And you know, we can crawl competitor decides they're public. Um, we can have a look at what trends to optimize for early on and seasonally, and we can actually find pretty obscure correlations between content and rank. And this is quite a good example here. So this represents just the day worth of SERP data track terms we were looking at. It's about 1.6 million rows of data. And what we're trying to look at is how much of an impact having a lot of high quality reviews on your product pages means to, you know, its rank in the SERPs. And you can actually see that huge amounts of of quality reviews means that Google thinks you're going to have a better user experience because your users are going to get more information and ultimately ranks you better, um, which is pretty interesting. So we've talked about a lot of information there. I mean, that was just one day of Google SERP data for some, uh, I think it was like 20,000 terms. That, and that's 1.6 million rows of data. So how do we cope with all of this? Well, um, it's actually a lot easier than you think, and you don't need it to be a developer or you know a technical director to understand and get results. Um, it boils down to three things: you want to collect your store and you process your information. And when we come to collecting, we can use all sorts of publicly available stuff. Google has loads of APIs. We can use crawlers and scrapers. We can buy data from data providers like Organic. Um, you can then you can store it in. There's a lot of easy to use solutions. You've got lots of cloud providers to use. Uh, you've got things like BigQuery, which are um, might seem scary at first, but actually very easy to use, um, as well as other database technologies. And then ultimately processing, there's a lot of off-the-shelf tools that you can just plug and play, um, like BigQuery. We've got Data Studio, which I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with, really great tool, and you can plug it into almost all clouds. Um, then you've also got Python, so you can have you know Pandas, there's NumPy, there's all sorts of great packages to use. Um, Google has a product called Colab, which is great. Um, it's got free GPUs, so use it. Um, if you're really, really crunching some big you know, numbers, you don't want to be trying to do that in Excel. Um, some tips and tricks. If you're going to try and transform some big data, then I would say you've got you to start with quality data, um, remove some of the, the garbage you might have in outliers. Definitely check your queries. If you're going to use something like BigQuery, uh, it's easy to rack up a big bill. So just just check that what you're trying to do makes sense. Um, and just plan out what you're going to try and do. And I hear this all the time. People get a bit worried about like having to to write some, some code to, to do something. But it's actually, there's so many guides out there, and there's so many packages and stuff. You don't need to be scared of doing that. It's actually very, very easy to get um, some, some of the results you might want out of data you have quite easily. Um, so that's all good. We've got you know a way to process some of our data, but Google constantly moves the bar. They constantly change their algorithm. They might make small changes, which you know might only impact you by one rank. But if you're a big retailer, that equates to millions of pounds of lost revenue, um, and it becomes quite difficult. And they've got core updates as well, which really fundamentally shake up the way that they might rank your website. 
So how do we tackle that? We're not going to be running our analysis every time and changing and tweaking our code and changing the way we process things. We need to, to keep up to date with it or try and predict it. Um, and I think that's really where machine learning comes in. Now, um, I'm not going to be able to have time to dive into anything crazy here, but you know, things you should definitely have a look at is there's some great tools from, from clouds out there, cloud providers, that you don't really need to understand too much of what you're doing. You just need to understand what you want to get out of it and what um, data you have available. So definitely check out some of the auto machine learning stuff from Google and IBM. Um, there's some great packages in um, Scikit-Learn from Python. If you just go on their website, I guarantee somebody's probably already given what you're trying to do a go. And going back to Colab as well, it's fully used to fully utilities. Um, and there's some really great transformations in like BigQuery that you can do where you can do like k-means clustering, so you can actually find some groupings and stuff that you might not have been considered before in some of your your data. Um, and ultimately, that ties back to giving your clients, you know, cutting edge information that nobody else has. Appreciate there was a lot to take in. Um, I hope people get some ideas from this talk, but you can always um, contact me or we can have a chat afterwards. Thanks. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Laurent. That was really, really interesting. Next, we have got Sabrina, who works for Neo Media, and she's going to be talking about long tail queries. Do you want to introduce your talk, Sabrina? Thank you. Um, yeah, so today we'll be talking about long tail queries and strategies to become more visible in that space. So I'm just going to share my screen and hopefully you guys can all see that. Um, so I'm just, oops. Yes, great. So firstly, um, I am Sabrina working at Neo Media World as Jay just introduced. And so we will be focusing on long tail strategies. So firstly, a quick agenda. Um, why should we be paying attention to this space in the first place? And secondly, um, after we realize how important this is, how do we then go about identifying these opportunities? And then after we've collected all our data, how do we then go about prioritizing these opportunities action plan and move forward? So why should we have a query space in sense? That's how compared insurance. To so a local pack, you have to scroll quite far to get to some branded sites. So this is one example, just if it can be to rank for really generic um, keywords which have a really high search volume. In um, so firstly, what we can do to get around this is to think about some really key um, spaces where we can have these long tail queries, which tend to be more niche. This is because some people will have um, started already going through the acquisition funnel. So firstly, we have the awareness phase and the interest. And these tend to be the spaces where people are using the generic head terms in the first instance because they're doing their initial research and information gathering. And then it's once they move through this a little bit further into the consideration and intent that we tend to find people asking more long tail queries or sometimes even questions. And this tends to be a space which is less competitive um, and a bit easier to rank in the top spaces for. It's also noteworthy to mention that typically with these long tail queries where a keyword has three or more keywords in them, um, that the conversion rates for these are sometimes two and a half times um, better than for um, the head terms in the first place. And this was a study done by a conductor. So there are some really key stats here that I will also take us through a little bit more. So this was a study done by um, Moz, which showed that actually 70% of all searches that are performed online consist of long tail keywords. This is where there is a keyword with three or more um, words in there. 
So we can see that this is a huge amount of the queries which are being asked. And they're also very unique because they have very low search volume in this particular visual where there are um, maybe only tens of searches for each particular query in each case. So this just shows us how people are searching quite differently from perhaps what they used to might search for um, back a few years ago. So this is becoming about more focused to that user and making sure that they're engaged at each step of their journey. Um, another study that was done was by um, AHRS. So this shows us that from their 2019 database of all their nearly 2 billion keywords, and that 92% of these get 10 or fewer searches per month. So this just shows us the, again, and reiterates just how people are searching. They're making more unique searches for their particular need at that moment, whether it is I want to know or I want to go, I want to buy, et cetera. There's all these different micro moments that we have to tailor to the users at that particular stage in the acquisition funnel. This also shows us um, that in this particular case, if we look at the right far column of this graph, that actually um, of the keywords that get at least 10,000 search volume a month, that nearly 30% are actually long tail keywords because the green, orange and red bars are where the, there are queries which have long, more than three words in them. So this just shows us how much more popular this is becoming. And it's not always the case that these keywords have low search volume. So sometimes we need to really question the myth that we have or the stereotype that we might have about these long tail queries. For example, um, if we search for how to lose weight, that's a long tail word, but that actually has 90,000 searches per month. Whereas the more generic term lose weight actually only has 30,000 search volume a month. So that's just one example of how we can think about the value of long tail keywords. So now that I've gone through um, the, really, the real importance of this, let's start to think about how we can actually use this um, for our own data and how we can benefit from these insights. So this is a screenshot that I have taken from Google Analytics. We can actually plug in um, Google Search Console into our analytics profile to get some insights. So what I've done here is to use a matching regular expression so we have used the terms in this instance, what, why, how, and when, but we can use more. But in this instance, there are four terms that I am filtering for. So we can see that there are these long tail queries that we are already being um, visible in. We are already ranking in this space. So this is where we can find opportunities where we are already visible, but perhaps we might want to find ways to make ourselves appear in the top um, positions. So what we can do is then start to filter by position perhaps towards the bottom of the first page or maybe even the second page. And then we can find these opportunities and think about how we can then make our content on our website more relevant to be able to um, boost the, lift, the rankings and, and then be able to attract more visitors to the site. So this is some initial analysis that we can do. So what I now want to talk about is um, the different features such as people also ask. This has been a really popular feature that has risen dramatically in the last couple of years. We can see that from this, this is a study done by a, um, AWR. Um, we can see that actually um, in 40% of searches that are done on mobile in the UK, that this feature is present. So this shows us just how popular it is that people are searching for long tail queries or even questions. Um, and this is becoming more popular among all the different searches in addition to position zero. And this also ties really nicely into thinking about voice search because this naturally um, is the way that people might use their assistance either on their mobile or they might have their own home device like an Alexa or an assistant in their own home. So by optimizing for um, long tail queries, we're also um, being future proofing for voice search as well, which is a trend which has been increasing in every demographic in the last few years. So now that we are able to get some um, information from our own website by looking in Google Search Console and Google Analytics, 
There are some other tools which can really be helpful as well. So we can use Ahrefs, which I really like personally because this actually matches the query to the question itself. So in this case, we have the keyword coffee frother, and then we are able to identify what the type of demand is um, by the volume. And then we can also see what the kind of questions that are likely to be served in this space as well. Um, this might be what people might be searching for after their initial research on um, the coffee frother. So that's more of a generic term. And then we can also think about afterwards, once they've done their re a bit more research, we can think about how we can target these to keep them engaged throughout the whole journey um, and make sure that we are targeting these long queries. So this also gives us a good information about how all the different questions might relate to each other and also how they might relate to the keyword which generates them in the first place. So there's a, a few methods of how to collect this data. So then what we can do is start to collect all of this information. We have here some short tail keywords, but also some long tail ones. Um, some questions as well, like how to make macchiato uh, coffee. Uh, we also have the volume. So in a lot of cases, we cannot actually find the volume of questions, but we can find the volumes of the keyword which generates the questions. So sometimes we might want to use that as a visibility metric instead of um, trying to find a way of understanding the demand. And then from these keywords, we can then map the questions that are produced from this. Um, so that we can understand these relationships better. So we can collect all this information from all different sources, um, both our internal platforms, but also external tools. Um, so now that we have collected this data, how do we prioritize this? So we can actually order this in terms of either demand, but also we can think about the relationship. How many questions are being asked around one particular topic? Because if there are a lot of unique questions around one particular topic, that shows that there is a lot of demand there. And if we create this content, um, it will likely be that there are people searching for this and are ready to view this content when they make those searches. So those are two different ways that we can in terms of how to then create an action plan. So lastly, um, we want to understand then how we can use this information and how we can action this. So we've collected this data and now what we can do is from this, we can understand how to target pages um, to the right use and the right audience as well. Um, we can also understand perhaps what kind of information we might want to serve on an e-commerce site if this is a product page. Sometimes we want to have the content there as well to make sure that this is viewed as really relevant. Um, and it's also important to think about how to send the right signals to search engine spiders. Um, so in this case, some of this will be Q&A content. So we can then mark these up with structured data such as Q&A or FAQ, depending on the type of content and page that this is for. But it's also really key to um, realize that this is very natural conversational language that people are using when they're searching. So it's important to keep in mind that this is the way that we should be writing content as well in this conversational style so that it is more natural. Um, we know that this is a move that Google is really keen in making because of their updates in the algorithm, such as BERT, which is understanding all the different neural connections between keywords as well. Um, and it also means that if we are targeting pages in this way, we're also naturally optimizing for voice search. So it is, some, it is a process which is quite efficient in terms of time and effort. And it's a space where the conversions are likely to be much higher than they are for generic terms. So in terms of thinking about time and effort, in terms of gathering your data and making an action plan, it does often reap more rewards. Um, so I hope that I have given you a lot of interesting points to maybe consider and start testing yourself and think about how you can start to optimize um, digital content for this method. So thank you very much um, for staying with me um, and listening to some of the tips I have to share with you. Thanks, Sabrina, that was really Thanks, good. Sabrina. I have to say now I just desperately want a coffee after seeing all of those searches.
<laughs> Next up, we've got Sharon, who works for Times Internet, who's going to be doing her talk. Um, Digital Exeter, can we press play, please? Thanks, Becky. <laughs> Sorry, it's just loading up. <laughs> That was a really useful talk, Sabrina. There was lots of points that people could action and take away. Um, I've asked people to start thinking about their questions now. So hopefully we'll get some good ones for later on. Okay, so um, again, as with uh, the previous ones, um, if you double click these uh, slides, you'll see Sharon's uh, talk in full. And thank you for joining me for my talk. Thank you Digital Exeter and Tech Exeter for having me today for this amazing virtual conference. I'm Sharon Supriya and I head search content business at Times Internet. Today, I'll be talking about how to kickstart revenue growth with search strategy. Do share your queries during the talk on Twitter with the relevant conference hashtags to the handle as Sharon Supriya. We'll be more than happy to address. Before I give you a complete glimpse about the amazing success stories of search content business, let me quickly brief you about the Times Group. The Times Group, also known as Bennett Coleman and Company Limited, is India's most diversified media company with brands across print, internet, television, radio, and outdoor domains. The legacy of the company goes back to the 18th century, when the flagship brand Times of India published its first bi-weekly. Since then, the company has consistently reached greater heights by entering new markets and launching new titles. Yeah, those numbers are true. Times Internet is the digital wing of the Times Group. We are India's largest digital products company with 550 million plus monthly users, 67 billion monthly page users, and 128 billion plus monthly minutes spent on all digital products put together. We reach two out of three Indians. We cater to all kinds of content you can think of, from news, entertainment, music, sports, gaming, dining, or OTT, from our 38 plus digital products. Our flagship digital products with respect to each of these domains have made their own mark in the market. Here is a quick look at all our digital products. I love the music of the company bio video, and I hope you guys enjoy it too. you all liked it. Do visit us to experience the best of everything every day. A company with such a legacy and uh, being the most sought of content producer across domains, what keeps us moving forward is our urge for new growth curve with respect to just not reaching the next billion users, but also to make revenue with products that matter to the end user. That's exactly when a team of professionals from our product, business, and search joined together in a roundtable conference room to brainstorm. When we studied and cohorted all our data over and over again, what we realized is while 50 to 70 percent of our users come from search, he said something more the users are searching for and we don't have the content yet. And is there a revenue model with respect to search traffic alone other than programmatic ad optimization? And that was the day one, or rather was the inception of search content business team at Times Internet. This is how I broadly categorize search products revenue model. Number one, a constant lookout for next leap in new business opportunities. How do I elevate the revenue growth of existing businesses whose primary traffic comes only from search? And lastly, the possible business partnership I can look out for for a business situation. So let's look at new business or revenue opportunities through search traffic. 
We identified 250 million search queries, which we don't have content for. The 250 million search queries were more to do with non-use categories, such as information, informative, transactional, comparison, how to, what is, Q&A, and so many more. One among those categories was product review, and the search trend was increasing exponentially month on month. Immediately, we launched a new category called More Search Products, which compiled listicles of product reviews and also linked to the respective product pages through affiliate marketing. A sample of it can be seen here. As seen in the screenshot, we try our best to rank content specific to a product. When the user lands to the specific article based on data-driven heat map study, we carefully place the relative product widgets. When clicked on lands to the respective product page in Amazon. With detailed product UI study, um, we have delivered CTR of 20% up and up to 9% conversions from these article pages alone. The highest CTR by any content-driven affiliate marketing across publisher sites in the world are stored by Amazon themselves. All we did was SEO stated the requirement, content marketing fulfilled it, and affiliate marketing churned in the right revenue. For the second revenue model, let's look at existing businesses whose dependency on search traffic is immense. As you can see, Times of India education categories uh, has around like 70% traffic only from search. The most search query in this category is with respect to exam results and admission dates. That was the opportunity though for us, university and colleges who are looking for quality leads for admission. By adding relevant lead forms within the content with a sponsor tag, we were able to generate 50 times more leads than the display ads. The pricing of leads in India is across six to eight dollars through Google Ads. Our pricing was as marginal as display or Google Ad cost. For the colleges and universities, it was more beneficial as the students or parents looking for admission details or related exam results in articles also found college or university details that mattered to them. So all we did was understood the user cohort on a regular event-based articles, reached out to the possible clients who were looking for targeted users to market their universities, added value proposition that mattered to the end user, and delivered quality leads that was beneficial to the client and helped the user as well. So tactful thinking didn't just help us in making revenue through transactions or leads, but also helped us convert the search traffic user to loyal users and even drive subscription based on the intent of the user. Tier business and astrology categories are some of the best examples where we have seen significant growth in loyal users base along with the revenue. Now let's quickly look at one of the most prime business deals. Partnerships. When we looked at the possible revenue and building loyal users opportunity through search traffic, let's just take a quick look at how this changing search trend specific to usage of voice helped us for promising partnership with Google. Voice search is growing and moving to 70% year on year. Times Internet, we were quick to understand the growing pulse and started creating podcasts in English and other languages at a very early stage. Today, we have more than 3 million plays in a month for a morning pod podcast on TR alone. Considering the availability of the content and everyday raising demand, we co-marketed with Google to increase awareness of voice and podcast using Assistant to increase the reach. In numbers, we have seen 100% jump in Times of India brand keywords during this campaign, an exponential increase in Google assistant usage as well. So that's some of our success stories. You can always reach out to me on LinkedIn, Twitter, or through email as shown on the screen for more detailed talk. Thank you and uh, have a great day. That was fantastic, Sharon. <laughs> Again, more talk about voice search there as well. So, 
Um, while everyone is thinking about what questions they want to ask our esteemed panel, um, I just want to thank you, first of all, for your talks. And I'm going to kick off with a question of my own. Um, what have you seen um, in the SEO world since the, the this onset of the pandemic? How has SEO changed um, uh, in this pandemic? Shall I go first? <laughs> <laughs> Go on, Lauren. Um, so one thing I think we've seen is um, from our side is quite a few people who've furloughed their staff, um, including digital teams. When obviously there's there's a lot of push to for a lot of brands to go direct to consumer, um, and we've helped quite a few brands go direct to consumer, and notice that they've actually had an opportunity to to make space in um, SERPs and actually been able to to make their mark because they have good content that's authoritative in their space because obviously they, they are the manufacturer at the end of the day. So um, it's been interesting that they that there's a few that have made a real impact because they've just had people on, you know, on staff to, to do it. Whereas you've had large retailers that have fallen by the wayside and now paying for it. Um, so that's something so, I've seen. So it's created the space for opportunity Definitely. Um, in, in adversity. Um, Sharon, you were going to say something. So, yeah, I mean, uh, we've seen like a significant spike across the sections. Uh, some of them are something to do with like near me keywords. We've seen like a 500% jump in, you know, health related keywords such as immunity boosters, vitamin C, and digital classes. Like, you know, how do I teach online, learn online, classes online, you know, that's grown by like 300% or uh, there's like 2.5 kind of growth in like professional courses also. So yeah, that's uh, that's the kind of a trend that uh, we see uh, in India right now. So it's created a whole load of, of new keywords that people are searching for, a whole yeah. load of new um, categories, I suppose, that suddenly yeah. um, uh, businesses can take advantage of and be perhaps first to market with them. Yeah, definitely, yes. So, uh, for uh, for example, Amazon uh, during the lockdown period, there were no supplies for for almost like a two months or so. So when the lockdown was lifted, uh, we expected like you know that because of the economy, you know, has like lowered down and uh, uh, people losing their jobs and things like that, we would so we, we expected that some kind of uh, uh, depression in the kind of you know the, the kind of product people would buy, but that wasn't actually the case. We, we've seen like a 5x growth in terms of the sales just after the lockdown was over that the supply started running and these were not where these products were not uh, the branded products as such they were more about like sustainable products over a period of time you know so the, the kind of uh, consumption to search has definitely differed over a period of time yes and so customer habits are actually maybe becoming they're changing for the long term not just for the short term for a change in circumstances yep. as well Sabrina, what have you noticed? Um, we've also seen changes in people's habits and the way that they engage with different brands. Um, so we have seen that this has been a particular spike in digital users because um, there was a lockdown period. Obviously, there is the lack of ability to restore and understand about the offering there. So this definitely created a spike in terms of e-commerce sites. Um, with the kind of orders that we that um, e-commerce sites were having to really manage. But I think as well, this also has had a really strong impact on Amazon, as Sharon said. So some of the um, sites that we do service also have presence on Amazon, whether that is through sponsored ads or even organic traffic as well. So we've seen that there are people that are engaging more with Amazon, I think partly because of that promise about quick delivery. Um, because perhaps other sites are not able to make that promise about the time frame of delivery. Um, what we've also seen is that um, as lockdown has been easing, that there is actually some uplift in demand of people searching in terms of a local um, intent as well. So we have been seeing that actually pick up um, where we did initially see that really drop really dramatically with a lot of businesses being closed. So now that there is that freedom, we are seeing interaction there as well. So it wasn't necessarily a permanent shift. 
It was like the users were just assuming that locally the shops were closed. They were having, they were going to Amazon straight away. And now they know that local shops have been able to pivot and being able to offer curbside pickup or um, click and collect order, orders um, that they're now wanting to go back to a more local based. Um, yeah, I would, I would agree with that as, as well. Um, are there any other points you want to, to bring up about the pandemic before I move to the next question? Okay, so we've got a question. Um, uh, um, Benjamin, if I could ask you to clarify your question a bit in the chat, because I'm not sure what you mean by particular data groups. Sorry, I'm a non-SEO person here. Um, what I'd like to ask um, next is, um, there's been a lot of talk about um, content and, and what what would you guys say makes good quality content and how can you make it work harder for the business? Who wants to pick that one up? Um, whatever makes user happy, that's what I would say. Uh, create for the user, not uh, for a specific traffic channel. I think that would be a better approach when it comes to uh, you know, ranking on search as well, making some good projects. Yes, I agree. I think sometimes um, if we are thinking about content categories to really invest in, um, we can quickly get caught up about the objectives and the goals, but we actually need to really think about the purpose of this in terms of the user and how would the user find this interesting and how is a likely channel or the direction that they would take in their journey to find that. So it's about being able to get in that mindset and first and foremost, and setting the users the best way rather than thinking from the perspective of um, the extent you know which creating that uh, of the edge of the user. We lost you a little bit at the end there, Sabrina. Why your connection just captures um, catches up. I'm gonna ask Lawrence about um, about reviews and reviews from a content point of view yeah um i think one great thing about reviews and it's it's all it's that age-old question of people just want reviews anyway especially marketing teams to just show that your product's good but aside from that reviews shows google that you have authority in that situation or you know there's um, expertise of not just your site but the people that visit your site and they'll reward you with that so you know, it, it, from, from me, I'm definitely one of those people that even on Amazon, I'll look at a product and I'll read the review straight away before I buy it. Um, forget all the product jargon and blah, blah. I don't really care about that. I'll just go straight to the reviews and have a look. And obviously Google recognizes that a lot of people search that way as well. Um, so review, you know, showing results that have really great reviews is priority for them because ultimately you get a better user experience at the end of the day. So I suppose that also kind of comes into structured snippets and making sure that Google understands what the content on the page is. Does anyone want to, to explain in a bit more detail for people like me who, who aren't really conversant in structured snippets? Yeah, so um, I don't know if they changed the terminology again, but um, I still know it as rich snippets. Um, but you know, it's really about structuring your web pages and most CMSs will handle this for you now, but um, just making sure that it's clear that you've got you know the right metadata on each segment of your site, so that when Google does come along and crawl and index it, that they're able to pull out that information easily. Um, you know, Google Search Console is also a great tool for having a look at your pages and finding errors like that. And there are um, rich snippet tools that they also provide that you should definitely check out if you're ever worried about your. Um, site because it tells you exactly what Google would look at if they were trying to pull out rich data. Um, isn't there isn't there a big debate going on about Google sunsetting one of those snippet tools? I, I'm pretty sure I read something about that in the in the Women in Tech SEO forum, which I sometimes hang out in. Um, that there was sunsetting that. Um, Lauren, will you look at the at the chat and um, and take a moment to think about um, Benjamin's question? Mm -hmm. um, which I'll read out in a second, but if you want to, to think about it. Um, uh, I, I also think um, 
competitors is something that's that's come up with some of you guys. Um, how important is competitor analysis, and and what tips do you have on on approaching competitor analysis? Sharon, do you want to to pick that one up to begin with? Yeah. So uh, we refer to Comscore and similar web. Uh, we also have our internal tool, also it's called as SEO sensor, which we built in house, uh, which help us to like have a detailed uh, review about what is doing with respect to what kind of content is uh, being searched and uh, how how well are we ranking and stuff like that. But yeah, so um, I, I would definitely prefer the Comscore tool for that matter. It's been exponentially beneficial for us. Sabrina, is there anything you want to cover with that? Um, we do this quite routine. It's really important to understand what the space is, how the space is performing, um, and what are the competitors which are doing something particularly well. There are great learnings and insights we can take from that in terms of um, the targeting and also how that performs, um, whether it is from a technical standpoint or a content standpoint as well. Um, often we find that there are real connections between technical and content. Sometimes a technical solution will really fix a content problem as well. So sometimes it's really important to think about the connections between the two aspects and not look at those in silos. Um, so there are different tools that we do um, that we do use to find this information, um, and um, we do benchmark across a, across a few. Um, but it's also really important to think about how that can inform your strategy, but make it unique at the same time, because that is part of um, the Google philosophy about having really unique and um, purposeful content, which is guided for the user as well. I mean, ultimately, in the search results, you're just trying to beat your competitor, aren't you? You're not trying to beat the whole internet. So I suppose competitor research really has to be at the heart of what a, a lot of people do when approaching SEO. Um, yeah, I've, we've had a question from um, Peter Gibb. Um, again, I'm going to let you guys understand this because I don't fully understand it. Um, how much difference does pursuing core web vitals make to SEO as opposed to improving general semantic HTML and content itself? Which areas will give the biggest benefits? Um, I can give this one a go at the beginning. Um, we've had a look into web vitals at the moment. Obviously, Google, in their infinite wisdom, never give away all the details, but um, I don't think you can count one as more important than the other. You know, ultimately, Web Vitals looks at um, a user's experience on the page in regards to are you shifting them around the page? Are you creating a bad um, experience? And are you loading in the most important content to them first? Um, and I think that will be really important depending on what kind of site you are. So if you are, say, a new site or you have a blog where you have in-page ads that could cause layout shift, you we'll probably see penalties from that greater than creating better HTML. Um, but I, I would say that importantly to each other, um, they pr provide the, you know, the same results to, to Google. Any other, anyone else want to chip in on that one? I'm going to have um, to ask you afterwards about what Web Vitals really is. <laughs> <laughs> um, I do agree with Laurent. We sometimes need to think um, more holistically. We can't just really focus on the really granular aspects and then it, um, really not pay attention to what other aspects are really influencing the performance. Because uh, I think as long as we are taking a standpoint of serving the user the best experience, that automatically means that we will be looking at um, layout shifts that are static. They are not being interfered with ads or, or um, we are loading the right content at the right time for the user. So if we're having that standpoint, I think that is the right approach to have. Um, and everything in your strategy will kind of align with that naturally. Um, so there, it also depends also on um, your market and your vertical as well. So it's not necessarily a really definitive answer for that, because it depends on how your site is structured itself, what the dependencies are on the loading and the interactivity as well. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, Sharon, did you want to bring up anything to do with that, or shall I move on to the next question? I think we can move on to the next question. Uh, Laura and Sabrina have answered almost so much in detail already. 
Yeah, awesome. Um, so, um, Benjamin, you were asking, um, and both both Lauren and I um, are just um, double checking um, ex exactly what you're referring to. But um, you're talking about um, the where Google analyzes data groups when picking preferences, in, and and um, are there particular data groups which have little or no impact towards Google preferences? Laurent, do you do you understand what what clarification he's seeking on your eat slides? Yeah, so if we if we are talking about eat, um, if we're talking about the difference between expertise, authority, and and trustworthiness, all of them are equally as important to eat as each other. So, you know, creating expertise in terms of having unique content that's relevant um, is just as important of, as having authority on subject and. That's why trying to get links to your site is also so important. But if you're not, you know, if you're ultimately serving a non-secure site, Google's going to penalize you equally as much anyway. So each of those three points are just as important as each other, and they need to be worked on. Obviously, some are easier than others. Trustworthy is easier to to achieve rather than expertise, which you have to work at constantly. But um, they're all they are all considered as equal as each other. I I think. What are some of the signals for trustworthiness? Um, so the main one is having a secure website, so having HTTPS. Um, that is really the big one. Also, making sure that you don't have, although Chrome is getting very good at this, but making sure you don't have third-party cookies that have no you know, weird flag set or that you've not got weird cross-origin scripts coming in that um, just make it feel to the user, like you're learning loads of stuff from other websites that have no, you have no control over. Um, you've got to be careful with that. So that's adding trust. And then also, you know, if you are, say, you've got um, you're an e-commerce site and you're doing a lot of your your payment, making sure that if you are taking a user off-site somewhere to pay, that it's from a, you know, a good authoritative payment provider, and that it, they're getting linked back to your site so that Google can, you know, trust that you've. You're taking them on the right path. Um, so it's just signals like that to make sure that you know users can trust your website, um, and it's fine to use it because Google wants to only serve sites that people can use and not have to worry about. I've seen in um, in the console coming up a lot of same site cookie um, warnings. Yeah. Um, again, I don't fully understand what the warning is about, but it does seem to be affecting a lot of websites. Yeah, it's a huge change. So basically, Chrome and, and other browsers that are following suit are stopping um, incorrect flags being sent on cookies, which isn't a huge deal for uh, a lot of people because they can they can just make it, they can change it. But it does, if you are using any sort of dodgy third-party scripts or anything like that that are being loaded in, they just basically start getting blocked. Um, but for most people, I would imagine all of your actual legitimate marketing technology scripts and things will be fine because those guys know that they need to implement it. Um, it, it is really boils down to just stopping Chrome is trying to stop things that are that look incorrect from being loaded on your website. Um, and that, I think that's also part of the whole Web Vitals. If we go back to Web Vitals, Web Vitals is about actually using Chrome itself to get better understanding of user behavior. So like cumulative layout, layout shift is actually using Chrome data of how people interact with the website. You know, if you're loading third-party ad scripts that have, have got wrong references on them, um, you can be endangering people on the website, but also that could cause, you know, your website to jump about and behave strangely. Um, so yeah, it, it all ties together. Um, Sharon, um, when we talked previously, we talked about how um, some of the the content that you've been working on um, at, at Times Media, how you you were amending that content to to put in um, some more retail elements and making that content work um, a bit harder to actually get a, a result, rather than just ranking actually drive sales or whatever the the, the metric was. Um, how, what did you look at, and 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 what kind of response did you um, did you get from making those changes? How did you go about going doing those changes? So, uh, 
as we saw in, in the slides, you know, that how important it was to figure out what exactly the user wanted to buy at that particular moment and then figuring out and making sure that we rank in those particular search queries. So once a user lands into your page, it's very important to figure out where exactly he's clicking. Am I really um, able to give that particular information that he's looking for? For example, we have a small widget of Amazon uh, just after the product. Initially, we just had, you know, the product name and the price. And that's it about it. But what we did uh, over a period of time is we started including the discount rate uh, because it really made sense during a pandemic. When you say that this is a discounted rate of like 30 percent, 40 percent, X, Y, Z. So that was enough for a user to understand, you know, and click on the particular stuff. And the second part was uh, when the product was not available. We say we had on the widget. We initially available. Now uh, that that. A little negative. What we did was we said that add a wish list because that was like a promising for the user as, as well, saying that maybe you're not going to get what you want right now, but add it to the wish list and maybe you'll get it after some time. You can go back and check it. So uh, that actually increased our uh, CTR rates uh, potentially. Like we started up something around like 13% to we planned up to like 20% CTR. So people clicking on the widget has increased for 20% as of now to the to our content. Yeah. yeah, just with that change, change changing the the concept of not available to wish list yeah so uh, we, we it's all about not treating your user as some person from another world but treating it as just yourself uh, i mean that would have helped me when i looking and buying something at discount rate that's really saying that i really want to buy that right now but if i say that not available i may like you know, try and go and figure it out somewhere else. But when you say active wish list, it's kind of a promising that I can always go back and check for, for this product after a period of time. Yeah. Yeah. I think we've only got a minute or so left. And I, I just wanted to refer back to the the one of the talks at the beginning of the day about accessibility. How important is accessibility in terms of SEO? I think it's it's good for you, for you to just have an accessibility plan in mind because if you follow that, you're probably going to structure your content well because it'll be user readable and then ultimately that's easier for Google. However, it's not at the moment, as far as I can tell, it's not strictly important um, in terms of ranking, but just following accessibility does mean you probably make a better user experience and better content structure and just better overall. Um, of course, you've got like uh, alt tags and things on images, which leads to being able to show up in image search and things like that. So you can get benefits there. But I haven't, I haven't seen any direct correlation between being any sort of like accessibility com compliant and ranking better. How about you, Sabrina? So it is quite important. I think it depends on the type of site that you are working on. If it is a global site, we want to make sure to be serving the right content to the right market. So um, if we are serving, say, this actually becomes more difficult for a number of different English speaking regions. So for example, the US, um, if we are serving a US site to a UK um, user, that's not really helpful at all because while they can access it, it's not the right information. And it also means that typically they won't be able to purchase or make that conversion on the site just because the currency is different. So we need to think about the right signal um, to, to different users. So whether that is about serving the right pages at the right time to different people in different regions. Um, whether it is, as um, Laurent said, about making sure that we have um, alt tags and things like that. There's also um, information about ARIA elements for people with other, perhaps, difficulties and whether it's to do with hearing or visibility, um, which is also really key. But we also need to think about accessibility in terms of, uh, is content really reliant on JavaScript? Because some search engines like, um, for example, Bing is not as advanced as So it means that sometimes they are not able to really access all that content. Um, so we need to sometimes be able to produce a down level experience as a backup in case that happens. Um, because then you put all this effort in, but then people are not able to actually read it or digest that information either. 
Yeah, that's a very good point to remember the other search engines. Just quickly adding on to that, one thing we do see is a lot of sites starting to use heavy, heavy JavaScript to render front end. Um, and like um, Sabrina was saying, if you don't have any fallback, if there's no accessible version of the website, your site is essentially completely blank to some bots. Um, so it's definitely worth considering. Yeah. Well, there were some really good um, points raised there. Thank you very much, guys, for, for your great talks and then also for the panel session afterwards. Um, I'm sure that you've all got Twitter handles or, or some sort of way of getting in contact on LinkedIn afterwards. So, um, so put, your, you know, put your handles in the chat so that people can get in touch with you. Um, but I just wanted to thank you for the session. I found it really useful and I hope the audience did too. Thanks, guys. Thank you.